Hello, everyone. I'd like to welcome you to a very special virtual conversation hosted by Random House about autism, neurodiversity, and living unmasked with Dr. Devin Price and Fern Brady. Devin Price is a social psychologist, professor, author of multiple books, including Unmasking Autism, Discovering the New Faces of Neurodiversity, and a Proud Autistic Person. His research has appeared in journals such as the Journal of Experimental Social Psychology, Personality and Social Psychology Bulletin, and the Journal of Positive Psychology. Devin's writing has appeared in outlets such as the Financial Times, Half Post, Slate, the Jacobin, Business Insider, Lit Hub, and on PBS and NPR. He lives in Chicago, where he serves as an assistant professor at Loyola University Chicago School of Continuing and Professional Studies. Fern Brady's caustic wit, exceptional writing, and eclectic stagecraft have made her one of the UK's hottest comedy stars. She has performed in 20 countries, including Montreal's Just for Laughs and Melbourne's Com Comedy Festival. She regularly appears on British TV shows, including Live at the Apollo, Taskmaster, Roast Battle, and the Russell Howard Hour. Her game-changing memoir on sexism and neurodiversity, Strong Female Character, was an instant Sunday Times bestseller when it was released in the UK and is now available for purchase in the United States. I'd now like to welcome Devin and Fern to the virtual stage. Thank you so much for joining us. Devin, I was so excited when I found out your book existed because I didn't that basically when I was writing my book, uh, your book's like taking a similar, not taking a similar approach, but it's made for autistics by an autistic person. And when I was trying to learn more about autism, I kept coming across resources for parents of autistic kids. Mm -hmm. um, and I just could not find anything to help me, especially with unmasking and uh, uh, and meltdowns and stuff. Yeah, yeah, it's um the the market uh, of autism books were such a like narrow range for a long time without ever taking our perspectives seriously or our needs seriously and mm -hmm. and the research is like that too. Um and I really think that your book is also such a great like it's it's like the anti-autism memoir because there's been so many autism memoirs in the last few years and um, a lot of them hit on the same notes all of the time where it's either the kind of stereotypical male narrative or it's the like I'm a autistic woman and I'm so sensitive and and delicate and and you know I'm a highly sensitive person and those kind of stereotypes and it just felt really nice to again have that caustic wit have just like the realness and the and the edges that that your life experience has. And I was just so, I just really enjoyed that in reading your book. Oh, I, I was so, yeah, I couldn't believe you read it because I feel like I'm a bad autistic a lot of the time. And I actually just today I got um, bothered a bit on Twitter because I was complaining about the good doctor and I saw, I saw you be watching that as well. So I'd never seen it until I saw trailers of it and thought this looks awful. And then I saw that clip that's going around last night where he's like, I don't understand biology <laughs> and all that. Oh God, um, the transphobic stuff. Yeah. 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 So um, I was complaining about that and I said, oh, we don't, oh, have our eyes rolling around like that. And someone said, your tweet reeks of ableism. Um, and just because you don't have certain traits that other autistic people have, you shouldn't be so proud of that. And I was like, that's true. But the problem is, is I still go back and forth with really wanting to blend in and really wanting to, um, because well, so, so much of what I do ends right things to say. Uh, I'm one of those people that wants to look as much as possible like a conventional woman um, because there's so much other stuff that's going to make things difficult for me that I want to try and make it easy where I can. Um, and a, lo a lot of the uh, books I was reading after I got diagnosed, they were all from women that came from the same uh, middle class background. Class isn't, doesn't seem to be as much of a thing in America or it's a, a bit different. But a lot of the memoirs I was reading was from uh, women from quite wealthy backgrounds, which then meant that they they were quite sheltered and quite protected by their parents. And I thought, I'm pretty sure that 
my version of autism or my experience of it is more common than you would think this thing of crashing from one chaotic event to another um because I'd read Asperger's er early on and found it really useful and every disastrous outcome that could happen to you having an abusive relationship having issues with food and different things like that I was like oh yeah I've had all of these so I thought I can string together all these different things and uh, use storytelling to uh, to show people what my autism looks like um, but I did, I did have someone complain that I, I talked about meltdowns and said well now everyone's going to think that we smash up our furniture and I was like no <laughs> It, it's it's just some of us I understand some of us can have shutdowns but I I just was writing what I wished existed when I got diagnosed and I think it's so important to have like bad autistics as if that's a thing like speaking to our experiences <laughs> and it's just so outrageous to me that somebody made that comment to you about um the smashing up the house meltdowns because that was when your book first hooked me um and I really knew that you, what you were doing with something was really important and it just really resonated with me and in fact that's one of the passages that I have pulled up in front of me here because it just meant a lot to me as somebody who also would like throw things out the window, scream at random mm. people out the window when I'm having meltdowns. <laughs> <done> I, I, <laughs> especially if somebody's being loud outside, um, yeah. I have like mass thrown out just tons of things in my house um, mm. when I'm just like freaking out. Um, and it's something that is just, there's so much shame attached to it. And um, I really thought up to a certain point for a long time that I was like an abusive person or something because I was doing that stuff and not realizing that it's just a meltdown. Um, and I, I just really loved how you, how you wrote about it because it just took me back to when I was in that place. Um, I'm, I'm going to do an annoying, you know, book, book panel kind of thing and just read the passage that I really loved if you'll bear with me. <laughs> no, it's, it's just surreal hearing you say, yeah, it's mad. Sorry, I don't want to seem like I'm sucking up to you too much, but I, I, I'm not that type of person. But yeah, it's mad to hear you say it. No, no, this passage is so good. Um, I repeatedly Googled, why do I smash up my house to no avail? Trying to stop a meltdown feels similar to trying to hold your breath. Even if you can hold it for a while, eventually you have to resurface. I stopped buying nice furniture as it inevitably would get smashed. My mom visited for two days once and immediately after she left, I pulled a cupboard door off its hinges and bruised my hand from punching through it. No one was in the house. As I tidied up the mess in silence, I thought, that's weird. Maybe I found mom staying stressful. Uh, that's just so relatable to me, both the <laughs> meltdowns and just like, and, and that like having to work your way around to emotional insight is also something that yeah. I think we don't talk about enough is that for a long I time. Yeah, there you go. I, I hadn't even heard of alexithemia until I got diagnosed and they said I had it and it's still something I've basically realized I have to work backwards and think of how I'm physically feeling and I, I still am I'm not it's frustrating when you think oh, I'm someone with self-awareness and I'm someone who's good at understanding other aspects of my autism since diagnosis and this is the one thing I can't get my head around uh, I guess we should explain um, what that means because it's kind of jargon you you explain it <laughs> oh yeah so alexithemia is this idea that autistic people not all of us but some of us can't recognize our own emotions or really feelings in our bodies like hunger thirst those are things mm -hmm. that are often related um, and whether that's an innate quality of autism or whether that's the product of a lifetime of being told oh the lights aren't too bright oh this room isn't too loud why are you moving your body like that? And we just learn to ignore our bodies and that's why we can't feel our emotions. That's kind of something we're still figuring out. But yeah, that's that's what that is. Yeah, when you say about the lights and stuff, I don't know if um, after you got diagnosed, this happened for me, it was like, suddenly I was able to recognize when lights were overstimulating and it was like I was able to break down each sense one by one and and spot that things were overstimulating me but I still find it hard to ask for um for adaptations or, or uh, reasonable was it reasonable adaptations accommodations, accommodations? Yeah. that's it accommodations <laughs> sorry so um I did a book event on Sunday 
and they were lovely but the lights were disgusting the big <laughs> chandeliers on in the daytime and like just loads of lights and I, I said when we did the sound check would it be okay if we maybe turned those lights down and then I changed it and I said or even just turn one of them off and straight away I thought they're gonna think that I'm hard to work with and then they turned them down then when I came back on stage for the actual event they were all on again and I just thought how can you run an event that lots of autistic people are attending and I'm autistic and at least some of you have read the book and you still have the lights on um yeah it's so frustrating and like let's let's talk about that the weird contradictions of like being a publicly autistic person and doing media about being autistic or touching on being autistic where they know at least yeah and just how inaccessible the environment still is all the way through and um and this is something you talk about a lot in the book just the stress of just working in media and just the constant you know barrage of of that that stuff I don't know how you even do it because even just for me just like the, the demands for like a last minute phone interview from a journalist who has a deadline the next day and you just have to hop on the phone right now or yeah. it's not going to happen to just having the the bright lights in your face. Like it's so overwhelming and people, even if they're wanting to talk to you about autism, they don't necessarily even think about how the nature of their demands are like making the space inaccessible for you. And I'm just, just so curious to hear more about how the hell you navigate that because it seems so so difficult even doing a little bit of media so that being your job I just am well that massive concerned. personal cost <laughs> so um yeah because I talk about that in the book the, the the one of the main sort of struggles in the book is that I have big ambition in comedy and uh if you're a comedian trying to break through on TV you don't want to do anything that means people won't hire you again right so you want to do as much as you can to be um eat seen as easy going and someone people want to hire again and then we get paid well for it and in the past I was always really poor I talk about in the book I worked as a stripper for three years at university I've had over 50 jobs that I've been sacked from or um politely let go even even when I was making an effort at the job, so I would still get sacked and not be sure why. So, so the way I do my job now is I think you can get through, this is going to be uncomfortable, but you can push through this because it's this or you go back to having nothing. Um, so it's not ideal. And it's crazy that I've done the book and things have come out and people think you can wrap it in a bow and say that, everything's okay now and the diagnosis sorted everything I still have meltdowns from work stress I, I reduced them a little and I worked out how to avoid burnout but unfortunately so many companies they they talk about helping neurodiverse employees but it is paying lip service um I mean even today there's people I'm working on the book with um I'll be careful how I say this. <laughs> it's it's not about the public, the American publishers. There is there is nice people that I'm doing uh work with on an aspect of the book, and they wanted me to go for a meeting in another city. And I thought, how did we have a two year lockdown where suddenly everyone could have meetings on Zoom, and we've just gone right back to this really impractical meetings culture. Because the, that was one of the best things about lockdown was that suddenly everything was really easy for a lot of autistic people. Um, and then it just went straight back to normal. Um, but yeah, to go back to your original question of how I managed to do my job while being autistic, it's really hard, but from what we know about other they're autistic people in employment. So many of us end up being self-employed because there just aren't accommodations made elsewhere. So I kind of just try and push through it because I get a lot of flexibility and time off. And when I'm off, I just have so much freedom. Yeah, yeah. And it's it, it really is just so untenable um, just being faced with those kinds of the social demands and the social performance aspect and just the unpredictability and the sensory overload, all of it. Um, 
you you mentioning that that issue with um with publishing stuff reminded me of this experience I had last year when I was promoting unmasking autism and uh, a paper a newspaper here I wanted to do an article on me and they wanted a photo shoot but they they wanted the photo shoot to be something that would seem natural but they also wanted it to be something that would look good and so they kept asking me like where are some places that you go every day? And I was like, I work at my house. And they were like, okay, um, but is there, <laughs> you know? So then I would say, but I could go to this bookstore where I know people that work and sign books and we could sign, do that. And they were like, well, but were you gonna be doing that anyway? And I was like, no, we're we're doing this so you have a photo to take. Like, are we not clear on that? <laughs> like, yeah. and it was just this strange, uh, you know, that social dance of like, you need to act like you're gonna be doing something interesting we can photograph because if you tell us you're doing it just to be photographed, then we can't take the photograph. So you should have lied and said, oh yeah, I go to the bookshop every day or right. something. Yeah, yeah exactly. That's, that's, that's the tricky thing is I still feel like I have to mask in so many situations. And towards the end of the book, towards the end of writing uh, my book, I got really interested in uh, Uh, physical healthcare with autistic people and how we can look after ourselves if we're ever in hospital or dealing with doctors and I think I watched or I listened to a podcast that you were doing I can't remember who you were talking to but it was another autistic person who said uh, that it's not safe to it's not always safe to disclose your autism to doctors right because for us telling a doctor we're autistic should mean all these that they can put certain things in place and they can treat us a certain way but what doctors are gonna hear is that you're neurotic or you're attention seeking or you're gonna be a pain in the arse um and like you said in the book um autism still synonymous with assholery I think he said mm-hmm. <laughs> um so that's something that really worries me because I've read about how um well, and I know from experience that our physical health can 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 go south because of doctors misreading us. Like I broke, I snapped my ankle one time, and I phoned the ambulance. It didn't come. When I phoned my boyfriend, he thought I was really really calm, uh, because I don't show pain the right way or something. It was ten out of ten agony. Um, so there's there's things like that that really worry me. Um, and I don't know how to change it. Yeah, and, and I think it's really important to keep in mind as we're in this cultural moment where people are talking more and more about neurodiversity and autism, and sometimes it is the lip service paying thing or this uh, just patting on the back of like, be open, be out, um, and just putting all that onus on the individual to be kind of proud of our identities when just because people say that they care about that stuff doesn't mean they have unpacked their assumptions about how emotions look. And what you just described is such a common thing where... Um, I've even just uh, seen uh, accounts of autistic people being written down in, by their doctors as drug seeking because they come to the office, they're in abject agony, like you're describing. They're not crying, you know, they're they're very, oh you know, God. steely. And they say their pain is a 10 out of 10. And, and what people don't understand is when we're really distressed, a lot of us shut down. So we look really flat. We don't have the energy to mask anymore. And that looks like looking really flat. Mm. Or we're just trying to stay calm because we know nobody's ever been sympathetic to us before. But then that means when we're at our most distressed, people see us as like robotic or dishonest or all of these things and they don't empathize with us. And it's really, it's unfortunately really dangerous. Yeah. Yeah. And then it's tricky to know what to do because I've had physical health problems uh, related to um, autism and alexithemia. Like when this book was coming out, uh, cause even when I get excited, I don't, um, I'm not great at recognizing it. So I was really, really excited about it coming out, but also really worried. I thought my mom was going to disown me basically. Cause there's a lot, a lot, of, a lot of sex in the book and, uh, we're Catholics and I just thought, oh God. So I had all of this going around and my boyfriend kept saying, you're getting really stressed again. And I said, no, no, I think I'm pretty calm. And while this was going on, I was getting excruciating back pain, this mystery pain in my joints. I couldn't exercise it away. Um, I was I tried weeds, like I tried so many different things and nothing made it go away. It only went away 
uh, when my mom texted me to say that she would read the book and she was like, I'm very proud of you. <laughs> and I was like, oh, so she's not going to sue me. Um, and then, but I went to uh, this pain doctor, or this pain specialist, and I told him I was autistic, but I was very on the back foot thinking this could go one of two ways. And he said, no, look, I, I deal with chronic pain and fibromyalgia and stuff. I'm used to seeing autistic women. But it was because previously I'd gone to my GP. What are GPs called in America? Um, sometimes they're still called GPs, general oh. practitioner. Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I went to my GP and he, um, I told him, oh, I think this might be related to autism. And uh, he said, you know, years ago I met this this lovely old doctor, he was so wise. And do you know what he told me about autism? And I was kind of readying myself for this revelation. And he said, he told me autism is extreme maleness. And I was like, oh! Oh. <laughs> and I've never gone back to that doctor again. Cause I just was like, you really built that up. Like you were going to tell me something useful. Um, oh my God. <laughs> but yeah, I, I really wish I could find a register of doctors who are, sympathetic to autism but in the UK our NHS is really you kind of just go with whoever you're assigned to <laughs> right yeah you and there are some registries here in the U.S. of just individually tracking like autism friendly therapists autism friendly oh, doctors oh that's amazing slowly starting to make our own but oh my gosh yeah with the NHS you guys have like no <laughs> recourse um it seems like yeah. a lot of the time um I mean here our recourse is just shopping with what dollars we do have which is not great but it's still yeah. yeah um so so you just mentioned the uh the idea that people used to have and some apparently still do uh it comes from this researcher simon baron cohen this idea that autism is an extremely male brain um yeah. And that's where we get the idea of like autistic people only love trains and math and science. Um, mm. They don't have emotions, you know, they're only analytical. All these stereotypes um, mm. come from that like idea that autism is an extremely male brain, um, which is based on nothing. It's completely made up. There's no evidence for that, right? Um, so, and, and, and it leads to a lot of women and trans people and others kind of falling through the cracks. Um, but, but what I was, curious to ask you was just um, before you knew you were autistic, I mean, I certainly believed more or less most of those stereotypes, even though I had like a psychology background, mm. they still didn't teach me any better. So I was just kind of curious, like what you knew of autism before you found out you were autistic, what, like, what did you think that it was and what did kind of learning what it actually is kind of look like? Um, well, before I knew I was autistic, I, I did always feel like, um, I did always feel like not male or female. I don't identify as non-binary, but I always felt like an alien type person. Um, but I think that just because I don't, don't, I didn't take on stereotypically feminine traits uh, uh, that are that are sort of put on little girls where I'm from. Um, that doesn't that doesn't mean that I'm male. Uh, which is what, because so I I did I did always think. Um, sorry, I'm getting tangled up here because I'm what I don't want to say anything uh, wrong about uh, gender or anything. Um, yeah, so before I got diagnosed, I did feel like a tomboy and um, and just an alien. And then I read about autism when I was. 16 because I was in a teen mental health unit I got put in there because I'd started just walking out of school and I couldn't really explain why uh, I'd just get up and walk out I just knew there was a huge I felt a huge pressure to do well at my exams and the pressure of that combined with all the fluorescent lights in school and all the social demands I just couldn't do it anymore so they put me in this unit they said that I had OCD which is a common, I've heard it's quite a common misdiagnosis. A lot of autistic women are misdiagnosed as having an OCD or borderline personality disorder. But I know yeah, that so they cool. can coexist with mm. autism, however. Yeah, totally. Um, so I was reading the DSM manual when they let me out of the unit, which again is quite a weird thing for a 16-year-old to do. And I read about Asperger's. I went to my psychiatrist. I said, I think this is what I have. And he said, uh, you can't have that because you're making eye contact with me 
and you say that you've had a boyfriend. And now when I look back at that, I think, yeah, but look at the boyfriends. Like I was always going out with, um, uh, well, I definitely went out with a couple of people who were autistic themselves, because often when you meet other autistic people, well, for me anyway, there's this immediate feeling of comfort and connection that uh, you don't feel around other people. That's just for me. I'm not saying that every autistic I meet would all fancy each other. But anyway, so I went out with autistic guys. I went out with um, a, a, an abusive guy. I had older people take advantage of me because I would get myself into dangerous situations where it felt rude to say no to people or um, because I was always worried about being polite, I wouldn't know how to safely extricate myself from that scenario. And that's something that's really overlooked with autistic women, I, I'd say, is getting ourselves into... Well, I don't want to say even just autistic women, but um, I know that a lot of us are more prone to abusive relationships um, and being exploited. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, if we look at, um, you know, ABA therapy, which is the main treatment supposedly for autistic kids, those who do get diagnosed as kids, it's just training them basically to be really compliant and agreeable uh, and to not be so difficult. And if you, mm -hmm. we look at people who didn't get that diagnosis, who are autistic, um, who didn't find out till later, we still see a lot of that same treatment, right? Like, um, of, of being conditioned by society to be more compliant. So things like you walking out of the classroom because you're in, you're really stressed and it's a really inaccessible, painful environment to be in. That's like great self-advocacy, right? Like it should be, you know, <laughs> we should view that as a great thing. Like a kid knowingly removing themselves from an environment that's, that's toxic to them. And instead, you know, we, we lock up kids who do that or say that there's something wrong with them. Um, and how does that experience not, mess up a person's relationship to consent and yeah. abuse, right? Like it's an abusive way of treating someone, um, telling them that they're exercising autonomy is a sign that they're sick. Um, so yeah, so we do see a lot of autistic women, queer autistic people, marginalized autistic people in general. Um, and you don't even have to be marginalized for that to be the experience. Like we all get told that there's something wrong about how we feel. And then that means that we can't we don't have red flags and alarm bells going off when we meet someone who who invalidates us and and takes advantage of us and yeah it's a really it's a really huge issue um, yeah um i have so much to say i couldn't think where to start it's interesting you're saying about walking out as advocating for yourself because in the years up to getting diagnosed i was um, without knowing it, I was creating a sensory diet for myself. You know how when kids get diagnosed when they're young, an, an occupational therapist will sometimes come along and create a sensory diet for them. Uh, so I was doing that by wearing noise cancelling headphones all the time. When I get my Spotify unwrapped report at the end of each year, I'm always in the top 0.1% of, of, of listeners. Um, so I was doing things like that. And I also was uh, secluding myself from social situations. Um, for, ex for example, I was doing a lot of comedy festivals and traveling around Australia and all the other comedians were out partying um, and I would just stay in my hotel room. But having said that, I don't want people to think that means that autistic people are antisocial because for me, I definitely got to a point where I was making so many mistakes in social situations that I thought there is no point in bothering. So it's almost just because socialising can be so risky and you just end up seeing it as lots of unexploded landmines and you just don't want to try anymore. Yeah, yeah. There's this stereotype that we're all super introverted, that we're antisocial. Mm. And it's so damaging because I think for a lot of us, I mean, I, I resonate a lot with that where I thought for years that I was an introvert and that mm. I was a misanthrope too. And the actual fact was just, I was like pissed off in public all the time because I was sensory overloaded. And I thought the way that other people communicated was like irrational. And so I like, I did think that I was like 
better than other people or those like you know those very edgy teenager kind of opinions well like, you're just yeah i've read your description of yourself uh it was so interesting to me because you um you come across as very high status and aloof and stuff so that was i was so intimidated by you and that was why i couldn't believe that you'd read my book but then since being diagnosed i've met i hope that's not a bad thing to say like you just no, seem really cool you just seemed really, really cool. And then, but then, I mean, before I got diagnosed, I constantly got told I was aloof. I got told I was scary. And I thought, why do people think that about me? Because I feel just nervous all the time. And I, I also have no idea what's going on in big group conversations. It almost is like 10 radios playing at once. Um, so it becomes more people project their ideas onto you and that was why I called the I find the book title strong female character so embarrassing I kind of called it that as a joke um and I deliberately I put a, a, all the way through the book I've threaded men doing bad writing about me or bad writing about women um mm -hmm. because men will project certain things onto you and they fail to see your autism um like people talk about female autism, you, you talk about this in the book. People will talk about female autism and how it's so much harder to diagnose in women. And it's now being challenged by a lot of the autistic community. Well, no, actually, doctors are just failing to spot it because of medical misogyny and putting ideas, their own ideas of, of women onto them. Yeah, yeah, totally. There was this idea for ages that, yeah, autistic women are more socially appropriate. They um, they can hide it better. Like the, they're putting the blame on women for their own failure to take women's suffering seriously. Yeah. Which is just totally what was happening. But just like when, when women complained a lot of these things, it was just not seen as an actual problem because they didn't see women as full people. So they, yeah. yeah, I'm trying to find the bit you said about in the book. Because uh, you you kind of broadened it out and said it was something about how female autism it's it, it's nothing to do with being female it's just to do with people people not being taken seriously. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm really misquoting you. No, no, that's that's <laughs> the gist. Find it. That's totally the gist, and that's why we also see like that's black and brown gist. autistics are yeah. um, are underdiagnosed. Like uh, yeah. people in poverty are underdiagnosed. Anybody that society says your suffering doesn't matter, and you're supposed to just comply and conform, um, you know, we're we're not going to look into whether you have a disability. We're gonna, or if we do, we're going to just say you have some kind of behavioral disorder, like you know. Uh, oppositional defiant disorder a lot of black autistics mm -hmm. get which basically is just kid who doesn't do what they're told disorder and then for women like you mentioned but, um, uh, borderline personality disorder and things like that um, well when I finally went to get diagnosed this isn't in the book which is weird because the whole time I was writing the book I was thinking of of this incident I finally got the confidence to phone my uh, GP to get a referral um, and in the UK, there's even for for uh, non-autistic people, there is so many hurdles at the moment just to get through to your GP. But it adds an additional layer of inaccessibility for autistic people. Mm -hmm. So I finally attempted to contact him. I got um, they do telephone consultations now. I think this was in the lockdown, too. Um, and this man on the phone, he'd never met me. He didn't have access to my medical records. So there was, um, because I live in England now and he didn't have this long psychiatric history, various suicide attempts and stuff. He didn't have any of that. He just told me on the phone, maybe it's not autism. Maybe it's borderline personality disorder. And I just, I dread girl interrupted when I was younger because I was of that generation. And I just was like, right, okay. Uh, I'm not going to deal with you. <laughs> Um, and I thought of sending him the book when it came out so he could learn about autism, but I thought he'd just look at it and go, typical borderline, and then just like <laughs> throw it in the pen. <laughs> I thought uh, he would do that. He'd yeah, be, that's probably true. <laughs> I thought he'd be like the lengths narcissists will go to or something. 
Right. Yeah, that's another one that a lot of autistics get uh, get misdiagnosed too is is narcissism. Both of those disorders, if you look at how they're written down, it's just like somebody yeah. who's difficult for a psychiatrist to deal with in some way, or that they see as difficult because you're yeah advocating for yourself. Like the well, the yeah, that was that's. Terrible. I, I cover that in the book as well. I don't know if any any of this has ever happened to you. I, I was looking at your tweets uh, about being anti-psychiatry today and it was really interesting because um, I never felt any stigma about being put in a psych unit or taking my medication or anything. I was really compliant. But when I was in this uh, teen psych unit, I was treated as manipulative. I was banned from group therapy. As far as I was aware, I was being pretty well behaved. I tried to make small talk with one of the nurses and there was a horrible incident where I got told that I was asking inappropriate questions. And um, all I thought was that I was making small talk with them and doing my best to mask. This is the thing, people say uh, women with autism mask so well. And I give so many examples in the book to be like, no, I fucking didn't. <laughs> like, that's how I ended up getting diagnosed. Right. Um, so, yeah, the the my experiences in this uh, teen psych unit really put me off engaging with um, any kind of mental health professionals for years to come. Um, I, I, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's it's so brutal. And I think, you know, I, I don't know what exactly it is that's going on there when that kind of stuff happens, but I think it might be something as simple as like a lot of autistic people, I think we're not as intimidated by authority or, or rules or this idea that we're supposed to like comply in a particular, like perform in a certain way. So like just being in a situation where you're not supposed to treat the nurse or the doctor like an equal to yourself. Yeah, I say that in the book. I was always addressing the nurses and the doctors and the teacher that was in the unit as if, oh, hey, we all work together. Um, and that's really uh, disturbing. For people they think something's up with you you get very quickly labeled as manipulative um and actually uh when I was an adult one of the best jobs that I ever did um before I did comedy full-time was I was a support worker in a halfway house for people who had just got out of prison um and it, I saw it with my own eyes people would get labeled as manipulative if they had any agency or any kind of, um, I don't know, even if they were just, I don't know, it was, even if they had any kind of personality, they would get labelled as manipulative when they weren't. And it was really disheartening to see it from the other side. Yeah, yeah, it's horrifying. And I do think it is sometimes, one of, like talking about autism having superpowers is obviously kind of goofy, but like, mm -hmm. I think it is sometimes one of the strengths of of how we operate is that we can kind of cut through a lot of those institutional performances or just the social rules that say you're not supposed to talk about this um you know we get punished for it when we're in a situation like being in an institution but I think there's just so much um I don't know power in us being able to just like treat all humans like human beings like that's another like I think it happens sometimes in the flip reverse where like we just have a great connection with people who society has like silenced or said you're not supposed to talk to that person sitting on the street corner or whatever that kind of thing you know well yeah no so much of my book is about being happy in groups of outsiders like I made friends when I was in the psych unit when I worked in strip clubs it wasn't an ideal job but I really got on with the other strippers because there was a lot of weirdos there um and then comedy again you're you're there's more autistic and ADHD people in comedy than than the average workplace so uh, constantly the book comes back to being comfortable around uh, unusual people um, and any time you look to groups of outsiders or the fringes of society you will find autistic people um, a book I really wanted to recommend to you is um, obviously my own uh, but let everyone buy that. Um, no, something I wanted to recommend to you is uh, a book called Unbroken by a woman called Alexis Quinn. And it's a tiny publisher uh, in the UK. And it's about a woman who uh, didn't know she was autistic. 
displayed really unusual uh, grief responses to her brother's sudden death, she started looking up uh, loads of stuff about funerals and decomposition, and it became her special interest, unbroken by Alexis Quinn. Yeah. Great, I'm writing it down. <laughs> Um, and she got sectioned uh, in a psych hospital. The conditions of the psych hospital made her have meltdowns. Every time she had a meltdown, she would get restrained, punished and sedated. And it was only by chance someone, uh, a doctor visiting her hospital, saw her having a meltdown and diagnosed her with autism. Um, but it just went on and on in this sort of Kafkaesque psycho and she ended up having to flee the UK to escape uh the British Mental Health Act. It's insane. Oh my God. Wow. Thank you for that recommendation. I'm gonna I'm gonna have to devour that and then and then yeah, try to befriend something... this person because wow. That's it's on it's I only heard about it on a autism podcast and it's one of the things I get frustrated about, like my book's only done well in the UK because I had a platform to begin with and I was on quite a popular programme just before the book came out. And then you read stories like that because that it's a big problem in the UK as um, autistic people being held against their will and psych yeah. hospitals that are totally unsuitable for them. Um. Yeah, and you just think they should have more of a platform. Absolutely, and that's something that um, uh, that people really don't realize. Um, mm -hmm. You know, I know that the UK, for example, turned away some Ukrainian refugees who were autistic when they were letting other people in as refugees. No way! Uh, I didn't know yeah, that. Yeah, yeah, it's horrible. Um, you can't immigrate to Australia or New Zealand if you're autistic, and you couldn't immigrate to Canada if you were autistic until very recently. All of these things are kind of built into our, our laws and our healthcare systems, just seeing autistic people as a burden or as incompetent. Um, and obviously, that's also a big uh, conversation when it comes to trans people in, in both of our countries. Um, yeah. And, and people trying to restrict uh, trans people's right to transition. Um, anybody who's autistic is seen as, you know, incompetent to know who they are and things like that. Um, yeah, and that confuses me. The... the um... The thing of it, it bothers me when people say that autistic girls are transitioning just because they're autistic as if they have no agency and don't know their own minds. It's 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 still being used as a slur to or uh, undermine us. Greta Thunberg as well. There's mm -hmm. uh British journalists here just still use her autism as a slur, and there's no consequence for it. Yeah, uh, yeah, it's awful. And and when it comes to a lot of that fear mongering, like um, just another thing that I wanted to bring up that you that you talk about so well in a book in the book, and that I think a lot of autistic readers can relate to is just um, the fact that you never saw uh, being queer or being bisexual as being bisexual is like mm. that, a thing to be ashamed of or like a noteworthy like like a problem, you know? Like yeah, I, I just didn't think of it, and I I grew up in the time when bisexuals were gross. Mm -hmm. Yeah, like I was watching the L word and they had like a plot line about how awful bisexuals were everyone saw them as kind of vaguely embarrassing attention seeking women um, so a lot of it was put on to me and my, my best friend is gay and she was she was like come on stop doing this now um, and then there's even a section in the book where I started to think uh, when I was, was at university I thought maybe I'm gay and maybe the alien feeling that I have is because I'm gay because I was watching lots of gay tv at the time um and I could see that there was a clearly established path when you come out uh, you come out and then you meet your gay family and they all accept you so I thought well maybe that's me but I was just bisexual the whole time and actually getting diagnosed autistic um really helped with that because I found out how many autistic people are non-straight in some way yeah yeah I, I think again it comes to that tendency of a lot of us to just look at what society is telling us we're supposed to be and saying well that doesn't make any sense forget that you know mm. I'm not going to do that um for as out of touch with our own emotions as we can be we can be so clear in some ways about who we are and what's right for us and looking past those societal biases um yeah and I just I just loved how you kind of 
described that because that's just so many bisexual autistic people I know and just queer autistic people in general that I know have had that experience. Too. This is not a big deal. Yeah. Like this is just the facts, you know? Yeah. And I, I do think, well, I, I never go in for the autism is a superpower thing, but um, I think a uh, positive to being autistic um, was it definitely led me into comedy because I mean, in Scotland where I'm from I'm from a very working class area and any working class pockets of the UK tend to have far less women doing comedy because it's still seen as this really undesirable thing to do it's not attractive and um, I feel like gender norms are a lot more enforced within working class communities Um, I guess because more often than not women are financially dependent on men so you do a lot more stuff to appeal to men um but because I never followed what other girls were doing at school I didn't crowdsource information from my peers I always looked to books and copied what people were doing in books I think that helped me um yeah because I'm I'm always interested in why there's less women doing comedy in those areas I live in London now and most gigs that I do are 50-50 men and women, but feminism always seems to benefit wealthy white women first. Uh, so it is generally people from very elite backgrounds coming through. Yeah, um, yeah, that's that's so interesting um, how that how that plays out. Um, I I did want to ask you more about just um, like having a career in media. And there was another passage um, from the book that I just really found interesting. Just again, just having to do with just all of the the weird social scripts that are just involved in working <laughs> yeah. in comedy, working on screen, all the meetings with like producers and things like that you have to do. Um, so I'll just, I'll just read it real quick. Um, it was also becoming obvious that I behaved in a way that was deemed socially unacceptable at work. I'd made the editor of a hipster magazine nearly cry on a phone call and wasn't sure why. I'd had meetings where the producers seemed to think I didn't like them because I'd asked what the point of the meeting was. People yeah. really didn't, I, that's so relatable to me. I'm doing that at work all the time. Um, people really didn't like it when I did this and would often say, it's just a general chat, which was intimidatingly vague with no discernible outcome. If you didn't work out the purpose of a meeting, it could mean you ended up meeting the person repeatedly, like the time I met up with a producer for years, wondering whether it was work or if she was just my friend now. Um, there was also the time that I let a pervy old agent phone me at nights and chat for hours without ever signing me, as I didn't want to seem rude by asking him why we had to talk on the phone so often. Um, the, again, this was just so relatable to me, e even working in a slightly different industry, but like I, at least both in publish publishing, at least we both have that experience of like, there's things that you say, and then there's things you're not supposed to say because your agent is supposed to say it. And there's times you're not supposed to contact someone directly with a question and and all these meetings where you're supposed to basically no, just, no one tells you <laughs> no one tells you um and, and thankfully my agent was very good at like explaining some of this stuff to me when we were like trying to like auction a book and stuff like that where it's like they're they just trying to find out if you're normal enough to do media and that's why this meeting is existing you know like so then I could have an objective right like but right. yeah this it's I just can't even imagine just because on screen work is just so much more superficial like how you figure yeah. out like how, how you've learned to like decode this stuff and like learn what the things mean between the lines there's there's a lot of schmoozing goes on and there's a lot of um having to be fake nice with people and it took I have an agent who in comedy who's amazing at that so I kind of copied him but for years before I got diagnosed I just was so baffled by conversations that I had that I would come home, I would do this all the time, I would come home from work, tell my boyfriend about a conversation, act it out, do the facial expressions that people made at me, and then he would explain what that meant. And that was how I was getting by for years, kind of trying to refine my system of communication, going back, chipping away at it and refining it. That's why I like stand-up, because it's like getting to fix what you said over and over and over again yeah like it's amazing I, for that and people yeah. in stand-up they're only ever going to respond to me in one of two or three ways like people don't respect women enough to heckle them generally so they'll just laugh 
look angry or bored. Um, whereas when I'm at a work party, there's so many ways people can respond and it's terrifying. So I always find it odd that people think that stand up is a scary thing to do because it's the place where I feel really safe. <laughs> Yeah, that's so interesting. Because I'm remembering things that I've heard, I think it was like Mark Marin say about just how sometimes you just have to place one word in the right place for a joke to land, and it just mm. won't be funny, that he'll be telling a joke that isn't funny for months. And then mm -hmm. one day you take it again, you know, you're constantly refining it. And one day you put the word in the right place and people laugh. Um, so that makes a lot of sense that that could be very like, kind of gratifying on like an analytic way to like kind of just test things out and figure it out yeah and of course uh, being autistic is such a good preparation for going into stand-up because you get comfortable with people looking annoyed at you for saying the wrong thing um because for the first few years of doing stand-up you're not funny and you have to bomb a lot I mean even I'm about to start writing a new show now and I'm gonna bomb for months um but I think being an autistic child and calling Constantly having people tut and roll their eyes at, to push you into stand up. Um, but yeah, to going back to what you were saying about social codes, uh, it's it's something I've had to accept that neurotypical people aren't going to, more often than not, they're not going to work to understand our way of communication. Um, although I've been told, my boyfriend's told me, you can't make blanket statements about neurotypical people. Oh, oh, heaven <laughs> forbid we, for, we offend them. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Heaven forbid I, we, I uh, did go through. <laughs> yeah. Um, but they do have their ways. Um, and you just have to sort of accept that they won't do certain things. But yeah, um, there's there's a guy I went to uni with who's a social anthropologist now, and I quote him in the book. Sam Friedman, he talks about studied informality in the TV industry, which is where people who are bosses of TV channels don't dress in a suit. They wear trainers and jeans. It's very informal. They often discourage you from thinking of them as the boss. And for someone who um, likes things to be really clearly structured, it becomes confusing when someone says they're not the boss and they're just having a meeting with you because they like you um yeah it's it's just a mess um so for years I really struggled with that yeah yeah it's especially strange when an organization like their myth about themselves being fair or being a family or this being a friendly chat like the objective when you're there is to just help prop up that that story that isn't true and that's like a very yeah. weird thing to internalize yes um, um and something I wanted to ask you about Hang on, I dropped my AirPod. Something I wanted to ask you about um, that I became fixated on, and I feel like you'll have something wise to say about. Uh, towards the end of writing this book, I, I wasn't sure who... I got this obsession with friendship and who were my actual friends, not in a paranoid way, but like I used to think people in the industry who I was just having general chats with were my friends because I'd met them a few times and I didn't have much insight into what made a friend and there's some autistic influencer that I follow who um, said something like autistic people often think people are their friends but then do you get invited to the person's wedding do you get invited to their birthday parties <laughs> and he was listing all this stuff and I was like no 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 Oh, so I, I know go, exactly yeah. who that is. Autistic Callum. Yeah. Callum. Yeah, they're they're great. Yeah. Yeah. Love his yeah. stuff. Yeah, yeah. So good. But so, some of the stuff Callum tweets makes me so sad. <laughs> and like <laughs> gets me really down. Um, but it's true. Uh, but I got, got so fixated on that. I do, I do have friends. Um, but my my boyfriend said, You're you're almost um you've got this very idealistic view of friendship now. And he said, you have to accept friendship isn't fixed, friendship uh, later close to another person. And it's almost like, because I model so much of how to act and how to speak from TV programs that I watch over and over, 
it was like I thought friendship was like the women and sex in the city or everyone and friends. It, it really was that naive. I had such a... Cause sometimes autistic people can have a very idealistic view of romance, and I think the same goes for friendship. But I don't know what you think. There. Yeah, totally. I think I think it's some of it's the like social scripting thing, which is just for anybody mm. watching. It's how yeah, many of us learn how to just converse and how to relate to people from like copying scripts from movies and TV. Like I learned how to be a professional from Mad Men, which is not a good place to learn that. <laughs> That's totally weird. You know, it's the 1960s and sexist advertising hell. Um, but that, that's how I learned how to like be a ball buster at work or whatever. Um, and I think that's also how a lot of us set out like romantic expectations, friendship expectations. Um, and I've been told multiple times, like, uh, similar to what you were describing of that person's not your friend. I don't know why you think that person's your friend. They're your real estate agent or whatever. Um, or, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> or just like, I had a draft of something, some other project that I sent to my agent and I had a lot of interviews in it. And my, in my mind, if I sat down with someone and I interviewed with them and then we stayed in touch afterwards, they were my friend. And so I was constantly saying my friend, so-and-so in the book. And she's like, it's, it sounds really weird that you're calling just everybody that you talk to for this book, your friend. And I thought, oh, I'm being really collegial or whatever. Um, so I think, I don't know. <laughs> I think it's both that we're like, so we're also starved for like acceptance and warmth. And like, we can't tell when people are being fake with us. And I think also like, there's a sweetness to that too. Like, I think we're less, yeah. tired, you know, in putting those walls up that like, that person could be my friend. Like, you know, why not? You know, and it's, it's sad we get I had the identical thing to you. My best friend, Lauren, who's ultra neurotypical, and she, um, I talk about her a lot in the book. I did that thing of finding the most popular girl in school and just clinging to her. Um, so she she was like, you're always calling people your friend, but sometimes it sounds like the friend is being mean to you. Um, and she said, I do it all the time. My friend this, my friend that, like an old taverna owner. <laughs> or something in Spain this is my friend um but a, a great thing about getting diagnosed was I realized that it was good to make friends with more autistic people and um a couple of comedians I know got diagnosed off the back of me getting diagnosed and now I at least have some people to talk to about very specific things that you can't talk to your um non-autistic friends about so that's been a a, a cool aspect of it because I get asked all the time is there a point to getting diagnosed and I can never answer it at book events because I know you've spoken about um how it's not always safe for people to get diagnosed did you yeah, yeah. Kind of the stuff we were just talking about with people not being able to immigrate and get healthcare and all these things. For some people, a diagnosis really unlocks resources and it's amazing. And I can't, you know, I can't tell any one person what's right for them. But um, I think it's always good to just affirm that like the autistic community absolutely embraces self-identified autistics. Uh, you don't need a diagnosis to, you know, recognize yourself in the community. Um, you know, if, if you need like the legal protections and the benefits, of course, but just kind of be aware of the risks too. Um, yeah. Cause I, well, I was self-diagnosed for years, um, before I got the official diagnosis. So I always just tell people why I got diagnosed and then they can make a judgment on whether they should. So I got diagnosed because I'd heard that it would signpost me towards the correct therapy, um, and because I was having meltdowns and I didn't know how to stop them. Um, and the therapy I got was a, it wasn't even therapy. They, it was a new thing they were trying called coaching. It was the same doctor who diagnosed me, who's, I, I was so lucky. I went to this woman who's like one of the experts in the UK and she's cool. And um, she just would teach me how to, be around neurotypicals but not in a way that was masking I talk about it in the book so she said like often when I'm getting my makeup done for filming they put loads of hairspray on your hair and itchy powder on your face and I didn't know what to say because you don't want to say to the makeup artist you're autistic or I, I don't I just found it difficult and uh, she said, you can tell a little white lie and say, 
hairspray gives me migraines or um, things like that. But I have been getting better at just telling people. And there's a lady who does my makeup for lots of jobs and she read the book. So that was great. <laughs> oh, that's awesome. <laughs> Yeah. yeah. And that sounds like an actually useful therapeutic approach rather than trying to change, you know, just like helping you navigate. How do I, how do I play the game that neurotypical people are often playing, you know, and, yeah. and say things to like get my needs met. Um, and I'm realizing we've gone over time. I feel like we could talk Ooh, for, yeah. for hours. There's just so much, um, so common, so many commonalities between our books. And like I said, I really loved reading your book so much and I hope people will check Cheers. it out. Um, Same so to the, yours. A, anyone who messages me who's just been diagnosed, I always tell them to to go read your book. Oh, thank you so much. Yeah, it's oh, yeah. um, I think it's been amazing. Just it came out at the right time, I think, for for what's happening in the world. Um, and it's cool to just hear so many people share those experiences that are so similar to to both of ours, really. Um, but but yeah, the last question that I wanted to ask you before we before we say goodbye um, is just, uh, what do you hope that readers take away from the book um well I wrote the book because it was what I wished had existed um when I was 20 I always try and make stuff that I wished existed for younger me um so I actually some of the stuff I put in there that I put in because I knew that there's really long waiting lists to get diagnosed and sometimes people can't access diagnosis so I put in something I hoped would be useful to both people who have been diagnosed and want to recognize themselves and then people who are questioning it but can't access a diagnosis um and I just want people to feel less isolated that sounds really lame but yeah no um, no that's I, genuine I put, that's real I put really humiliating stuff in the book and I, I put it in not uh not because I loved doing it but I put it in because Usually if you put the most shameful, embarrassing things about yourself out there, that's the thing people connect with. Um, and that's that's been the case in the UK. It's, yeah, been crazy, the response to it here. So, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that was definitely my experience reading it as, as an autistic person who's, you know, gotten in gotten in some trouble been in abusive relationships done some wild out-of-pocket stuff um and and been not the stereotype of what an autistic person is quietly lining up trains in the corner um forever um it meant a lot to me to to read it and so i hope people will check um strong female character out if they haven't already um and yeah thank you so much for for talking with me about all of this stuff and thank you it was so cool talking to you yeah yeah likewise